Hey everybody, this is Greg Gossett from Gossett Trading and Mentoring, and today is Saturday, March 16th, 2024. Appreciate you being here, hope you're doing well, and uh, hope you'll learn something today in my weekend review podcast. Uh, I am still in Santa Marta, Colombia, going on my third month, really enjoying it down here. I said this last week, but you know, one of the great things about trading is as long as you have an internet connection, you can do it from anywhere. Uh, a few days ago, I woke up with a pretty severe cold. You can probably hear it in my voice, so I'm going to do my best to get through this podcast. But, uh, you know, I found something interesting. I, I kind of look, looked back at all the times I was trading when I was sick, and surprisingly, uh, some of my best days. I had a record day on Thursday when I was the sickest. And so I'm going to talk a little bit about that, of why when I'm sick, I usually trade well. And uh, I'll talk about that in a little while. So hopefully that will be helpful. But um, <clears throat> and excuse my voice and if I cough and sneeze. Uh, but uh, so the, the format for the podcast today is, first of all, we're going to run the U.S. Legal Disclaimer. Secondly, we're going to come back. We're going to take a look at all the trades that I made last week, both on the daily and the weekly time frames. We're going to talk about when I entered the trade, why I entered the trade, what the setup was, what the strategy was, what my thinking was. And then most importantly, we're going to talk about how I am going to manage the trade going forward, whether or not it moves my way or against me. It's always important in trading, super important in trading, everyone that you have a plan, you're patient, you wait for your setup, you have a plan, and you know exactly what you're gonna do regardless of what the market does, right? We don't know what the market's gonna do. We have no control over that. The only thing we have control over is what we are going to do. And we can stack the odds in our favor a lot if we have a good basic plan, which would include being very patient, waiting for a combination or a confluence of, of indicators to line up in your favor, position size based upon the market volatility and the, uh, the capital in your account, uh, having a very good risk to reward ratio. So if you're wrong, you can be wrong small. And if you're right, you have the chance for an outsized move your way. And then knowing how and when, when and how to stay in the trade if it's going your way and when to get out quickly. But it's very important that you are very impatient with your losers and you get out quickly and uh, be very patient with your winners if it's moving your way. You're going to have a lot of losses in your trading career, but hopefully um, you want to set things up so that your losses are small and your winners are potentially big. And that's how you make money in trading. So we'll go through all my trades um, and I'll talk about the indicators and the setup and the strategy of why I entered the trade. And you'll see that if I'm wrong, I'll be wrong usually small. But if I'm right, of course, I have kind of unlimited to the upside, or right, if, 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 if I'm long. So... Um, and then we'll do that on both on the daily time frames and on the weekly time frames as well. Uh, after that, we're going to talk a little bit about trader psychology. Most important skill in trading is the ability to create that process, create that plan that I'm talking about, and then actually follow it. You can have the best trading process or strategy in the world, but if you don't follow it, what, what good does it do, right? So um, we'll talk a little bit about trader psychology. Always helpful for me to teach that, and I hope it's helpful for you to listen. Uh, after that, I have gone down through my master watch list, both on the daily time frames and the weekly time frames, and I have some interesting setups that I'm looking at next week, both on daily and weekly. Um, they're not where they need to be yet, but if they get to the level that I've identified uh, when I went through the charts last night, if it get to those levels, I will definitely consider taking the trade. And then after that, I will go through the uh, the indexes a little bit and the bond market and kind of give you my opinion on uh, where I think the market is, maybe where it's heading in general. So hopefully that will be helpful for you as well. All right. So uh, I'm going to run the U.S. legal disclaimer and then I'll be back in about 42 seconds and we'll get started. So hang tight. Thanks a lot. This video or live broadcast, like all instructional materials produced by Gossett Trading and Mentoring LLC, is created.
This video or live broadcast, like all instructional materials produced by Gossett Trading and Mentoring LLC, is created and published for informational and educational purposes only. Please carefully read and or listen to the U.S. government required disclaimer before watching this video or live stream broadcast. The video link and disclaimer text are located in the description section of this video or live broadcast here and here. Thank you so much. Okay, thanks for holding on and let's get to last week's trade. Let's start off with Rio, Rio Tinto. Uh, I did buy Rio all the way back here on the 29th of February. Now, what was the reason I bought it? Well, you can see the highlighted blue bar here. We had a gap down, immediately followed by a gap up. This is called an abandoned baby. And if you'd like to learn more about abandoned babies or island reversals, go to my YouTube channel in the lessons playlist and I have a video there about abandoned babies and island reversals. One of my new favorite strategies that are very, very strong. So the reason that these tend to work is because the, the day before the blue bar, we had a big gap down. So for whatever reason, overnight, the sentiment for the stock was very negative. The next day after gapping down, we immediately gap up. So we went from bearish sentiment to bullish sentiment immediately. And what I have noticed when this happens, when you have bearish sentiment to bullish sentiment, it really does kind of skew where that particular market's going to go in the future. Not all the time, obviously. Um, so it opened, it gapped open, and then during the day, it came back down and it closed the gap to the top of that abandoned baby. That is where I entered. I entered at 61.78. So I've had a policy uh, with abandoned babies and island reversals that these are a little bit longer type of trades for me. Usually with a lot of my swing trades, I scale out, I get to trailing stop level. I have a lot of rules based upon and very actively trading swing trades but on island reversals and abandoned babies i have set either a two atr stop or a four atr gain in trading you want to have asymmetrical risk to reward ratios meaning that if you lose you're going to lose less than if you uh if it goes your way and makes so whenever i have an abandoned baby or i have an island reversal i just set a two atr stop or a four ATR game. So again, we gapped down, we gapped up, we came back, we filled the gap. I entered at 61.78. I positioned size based upon the volatility. I placed a two ATR stop below, four ATR gain above, and I'm just gonna let this run one way or the other. One of, one of two things is eventually gonna happen. I'm gonna hit the two ATR uh, stop or the four ATR gain. This particular trade at the moment, is up 0.64 percent let's go to ung all right so <clears throat> if you remember last week i was talking about ung well let's start over here i did not take this trade you see the blue band here from here all the way over to here this is the buy area and when i did the podcast a few weeks ago this had happened we have a low followed by a low and then we had a big move up that took out the top of this swing high. This switched the, the structure into a bullish market structure. And I said, if it comes down and closes the gap, I'm gonna buy this. Well, it came into the gap, the blue shaded area. This was legitimate to buy right here. I just didn't buy it. I just wanted to go a little bit lower and close the gap, but it never did. But you can see we have the low followed by another low. We have the swing high. We took it out. This changed market structure to the upside. And ironically, whenever you change market structure to the upside, more times than not, you'll have an immediate move down followed by an immediate move up. And it's exactly what happened. So we changed market structure here. We came down into the fair value gap here. I didn't buy it, unfortunately. And then we had, and it moved right back up. But last week, what I mentioned was that if we come back into the gap, and ideally close the gap here of this abandoned baby I was going to buy. And that's what I did 
I guess on Wednesday, I bought it here at 1488. Uh, on this particular trade, my end of day stop is simply a close below this swing low here. And of course I have my, my two ATR emergency stop to the downside as well. The orange line up here, this is trailing stop level. So if I get to here, then I will go into trailing stop mode, which means that if I have a close below previous bars low, I'm going to get out of half the position. So I have a lot of rules, um, but I told you at the beginning of the podcast, regardless of what the market does, I need to know exactly what I do. So on, so I bought it here at 1488. The next day had a huge move up. Uh, I think almost 4%. And if you've been watching this channel, you know that if I get moves up the value of 0.45 ATRs, I take 10% of my profits off. Well, it moved up twice that. So on this big move up, I took 20% of the position off, locked that in and reduced my position size. And then Friday, yesterday, it came down. Look, it came right to that level again, the top from back here on 220, you can see, this is when I bought it, rocketed back up on Thursday, took profits, and again on Friday, look, to the penny, came to the top. So you can see that is some strong resistance, uh, strong support there. So um, again, on Thursday, moved up strongly, hit two profit targets, took that off, and then down on Friday. But this particular trade currently up, 1.78%. So not a bad start and especially taking those two off there. All right. So those are the open trades on the daily. Let's get to the closed trades on the daily. Okay. Uh, I did buy TLT, which are bonds back here on the 12th of March. Why did I buy them? This is kind of getting in the way there. I bought this because we came down, the black line is the 200 day moving average. We came down during the day, closed back above it. That's an intraday rejection of the 200 day moving average. That's a good setup. And it gave me a very good risk to reward ratio. So it went below the 200. There were not enough sellers there. It closed back above. That's why I bought there. So I buy there. I position size correctly based upon volatility. I my end of day stop will simply be a close below the 200 day moving average. And then my emergency stop is two ATRs below. Well, the next day it closed right below the 200. I got out very quickly for a loss of 0.49%. And you know, am I glad that I got out? Of course, because look, Thursday went way, way, way down, way, way, way down. So you're never going to have all profitable trades. I mean, it'd be nice, but you're just not going to. All you can do is wait for a level to be rejected like I did, position size correctly like I did, and know exactly where I'm going to get out if it, uh, when it closes below this 200. And I did. So for a very, very small loss, it's fine. Small losses are fine. They're not always going to work. But a good teaching moment here, when you lose that 200-day moving average, bad things can happen. And that's exactly what did happen. So I did take a loss on this of 4.9%. Microsoft, well, this has been a really, really interesting trade. And I did get out on the remaining shares with a loss. But I think, I mean, what I'm going to try to show you here is why it's so important to have a scaling out method that reduces your position size when it's going your way so that if it does really go against you, you have fewer shares. And again, this is part of my process playing both offensive and defense with trades. The defensive part is position sizing correctly, having an end of day stop, having an emergency stop, going into trailing stop mode. These are all uh, defensive, but the offensive part is whether you're long or whether you're short, taking partial profits when the market gives them to you. It just kind of makes sense, right? Trading is a game. In most games, you need to play offense and defense, just not offense. You have to play defense, right? So let me tell you and show you why I took this trade in the first place. So I did get short here back on the 23rd of February at 4.15.50. Why did I get short? Well, this bar back here on the 9th of February is called an order block. An order block is a to the short side is when you have a large move up and then it's followed by a structure break well 
this is the, the, the pivot point here. We took that pivot point out. This put Microsoft into a bearish market structure. So as it came back into this order block, it should not close above this order block. So at uh, Right here at the bottom was the bottom of the order block. It gapped open, so I got a little better price. I got short at 415.50. My end of day stop is simply a close above the high of that order block. And then two ATRs above is my emergency stop. So I got short 415.50. Got I got right the top. It reversed the entire day. I took off partial profits. The next day it opened up higher, moved down. I took more partial profits. I'm short, right? I want it to go down. And so I keep reducing my position size. So short 415.50, move down, reduce position size. Move down, reduce position size. Next day, move down, locked in profits, reduce the position size. Got to trailing stop level here at 405. What that means is now, because I'm short, if it if I have a close above a previous bar's close, I will exit half. Next day, not much. Then next day we moved up here and this closed above this high. Therefore, I got out of half of my remaining shares for a gain of 0.73%. And you'll see why that's important in a moment. Next day we kept moving up. Next day we kept moving up. And then we had a big bar down where I took, I think I hit three profit targets on this day, which is important, right? Because it eventually I got stopped out, but when it moved my way, I took more and more and more profits. The next day went down again, got some at the very bottom. Then we moved up, had a move down, took more profits off. Next day moved down, took more profits off. Then we ran up, we ran up, we opened here, we came back down, so I took more profits off. And then the next day, here on the 14th, we closed above my end of day stop. So the remaining shares, I lost 2.29%. But this was still a profitable trade for me. That's why the, the taking the partial profits is so important and having that process. How could this be a profitable trade for me? Because where I entered, I took off, I took off, I took off, I took off, I took off. Here I get out of half. And then every move down, I take off, even got another one here. So all in all, this was still a profitable trade for me, even though the remaining shares lost 2.29%. And that's why it's important that you have this process. And in my opinion, using this offensive and defensive move it really makes a difference. These partial profits add up like you would hardly believe, right? And it makes trading easier too when you have, because to have this trade here at 415.50 and it got down to 397.85, and then if you didn't scale out, and you end up taking a loss when you were down or when you were up over 20 points on the trade, that doesn't make a lot of sense, right? So it's important to me to take partial profits when I have them for all sorts of reasons. So this recap on the dailies, Rio currently, uh, currently up 0.64%, UNG up 1.78%, TLT, I had a small loss of 0.49%, and Microsoft the remaining shares had a loss of 2.29%, but again, not a loss. Over, uh, overall, this was a positive gain, but only because of my phasing out process that I use. Okay, let's head over to the weeklies. So these charts are weekly charts. I take these trades on Friday, since Friday is the last day of a weekly bar. Um, VIX. I have been talking about VIX on the weekly for a long, long time. I entered <coughs> on the 8th of March back here at 1408. Okay, so what was the reason for the trade? It was very simple. The prior week before, we were under a 30 RSI. I And I, I said for many weeks, if we get a close above the 30 RSI, I'm going to enter VIX. Well, we did get a close on the 8th of March, finally above a 30 RSI. Plus we had a V2 entry signal. V2 consists of three bars, bar one, bar two. Bar two has to go below the low of bar one. Bar three has to close above the close. That 
is a confluence of signals, an under 30, over 30, in addition to the V2. And if you'd like to learn more about V1s or V2s, again, I have a free video uh, on my YouTube channel. Just type in V1s, V2s, and it's a great, great video. And V1s and V2s are such a good entry trigger. Um, uh, they're really... A, the bread and butter of my trading because I use them in so much because really what it's showing you is that you're going to the downside but then immediately reversing back up so it's a false breakout to the downside reversed by a, a strong up move and that means something it's this kind of the same concept of why the abandoned babies and the island reversals so I did get long here 1408 this week VIX uh, during the week moved up strongly and I did take a profit target off Again, another example of taking something off when the market gives it to you. Because I, I bought, because it went under 30, over 30, my end of day stop is simply a close below the 30 RSI, or if I hit my emergency stop all the way down here. Currently, so at the top of this week, I did take a profit target off, and let's take a look here, just for the record books here this particular trade up 0.64% plus the profit target that I took. So that is VIX and uh, volatility does look like it has started to improve, which is why the market has gone down or vice versa, one of the two, however you look at it. But it looks, VIX is extremely low here and that's why for many, many weeks I said, I, I really like VIX, but I'm gonna wait until I get my signal and the signal was last week. Uh, with the under 30, <coughs> over 30, excuse my cough. Okay, so that's VIX up 0.64%. XLF, all right. Again, uh, you know, I always talk about being patient with your winners and impatient with your losers. I have been in this trade for almost a year. So if that's the case, it means that I have a winning trade because I would never stay in a losing trade this long, right? So I bought XLF all the way back here on the 24th of June, 2023. So almost exactly a year, just a week short. Why did I buy this? Well, this is a deep dip buy, just like VIX was a deep dip buy with the under 30, over 30 strategy. This is also a deep dip buy involving the 250 week moving average. This is the purple line here. During the week, we came down, we went slightly under the 250 and closed back above. So I got long here, 3071. I positioned size correctly. I placed my emergency stop two ATRs below. My end of uh, week stop, this is weekly bars, my end of week stop would simply be a close under the 250 day, right? Having it, watching the level being rejected. And then if you're wrong, being wrong small orange line up here is my trailing stop level if i get to that then i go into trailing stop mode so got long here 3071 next week moved up took some profits next week didn't do much next week moved up again took some more profits and i got to trailing stop level here at 30 uh, uh at 3280 now all that means is i'm in trailing stop mode and then if i get a close below a previous bars low i will get out of half we went down for about a month, but we never closed below a previous bar's low. We finally got a, uh, the first close below the previous bar's low here on the 23rd of June. I exited half of my position for a gain of 6.4%. Then we moved up strongly for another month where I continued to take partial profits. And then we had this big down move here. But look at this here on the 27th of October. It went below the 250. Remember, that's my end of week stop, but then closed above it. That kept me in the trade. Thankfully, had it closed below, I would have gotten out. Well, the next week we had a huge move up, took a lot of profit targets, and we had an inside week, moved up again, took some more profit targets, took some more profit targets here, took some more profit targets here, and all this has been doing is going up and up and up and up and up. So when do I get out of this? Well, again, it's having rules to tell you exactly. I know exactly when I'm going to get out of this. You see the, the, uh, the thin blue line here? This is the 5 EMA on the weekly. If it closes below this 5 EMA, I am simply out of the trade. I don't care that it's very, very easy trade at this point. If it keeps going up, I'll continue to scale out, continue to take profits. But I 
would imagine sometime pretty soon we'll close below this 5 EMA and that will be it for the trade. But this particular trade has been a monster and currently this particular trade is up 24.55%. But again, if I didn't have a process to tell me what to do, you know, maybe I would have gotten out here. If I don't have any rules, I just do whatever I want. It's important to have rules. Moves don't usually happen like this. This is historic, but every once in a while they do happen. And if you have a process to follow, you'll enjoy this kind of move, 24.55%. And then last but not least is J&J. &J. Oh, sorry. J&J &J here. Okie doke. Let's take a look at the entry. I bought this back here on the 15th of uh, December, 2023. Why did I buy it? Well, this was an intra-week rejection of the 200-day moving average. This is the black line here. During the week, we, we, we were below. At the end of the week, week, we closed above. In addition to that, you know, I always like to look for multiple signals. This was multiple signals. The first signal is we rejected the 200-day moving average. The second signal is we had a V1 bar one, bar two, bar two goes below, bar one's low, closes above, bar one's close. Got in here at 154.27. I placed my emergency stop two ATRs below. My end of week stop is a close below the 200-day uh, moving average or the black line. I placed my 1.5 ATR trailing stop level up here. So if I get there, I go into trailing stop mode. And if it moves my way from entry, uh, the value of 0.45 ATRs, I take partial profits. So the next week, it didn't do much. Next week was up a little bit, but not enough to take a profit target. This next week went up strongly, did take some profit targets. Next week went up strongly for a profit target and got to trailing stop level. So now I'm in trailing stop mode. Next week didn't do much. This week, we had our first close below a previous bars low. After reaching trailing stop level, I got out of half of my position for a gain of 3.33%. We move back down. Now, if it closes below the 200, I'm simply out of the trade, but it did not. And then on this week here, 223, we had another big up week where I took some profits again. We moved sideways for a couple weeks. This week, at the beginning of the week, it went up very strong and I hit another profit target before it re reversed. So you see how important it is to take profits on big bars when you have them because it reduces your position size. So if it ha does have a reversal bar, you have fewer shares and you locked in profits above. Make sense? So this particular trade currently up on the remaining shares, currently up 2.51%. So as you can see, I have a lot of rules. I, I do trade five different trading approaches. We talk a lot about V1s, V2s, uh, 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 deep dip by stock trading, but I, I, I also trade a total of five different approaches. And, you know, if you're interested in learning more about these approaches and these strategies, I do teach a one-on-one -on -one course. Uh, it takes five weeks for this course, just you and I, and I teach you step-by-step all the rules and all the strat all the strategies I've been teaching for many years. I've ta I've taught people from all around the world, from absolute beginners all the way up to the hedge fund level and everywhere in between. So, you know, if you're interested in learning how I I trade, and um, um, just send me an email. The email is in the link of the YouTube video. And we can have a chat. And uh, if you're interested, we'll start the lessons. But you're going to learn a really valuable skill that you can use the rest of your life. So, real quick recap here on the weeklies. Uh, the VIX up 0.64%, XLF remaining shares up 24.55%, and J&J &J up 2.51%. All right, let's talk a little bit about trader psychology before we move on to my potential trades for next week. All right. Here we go. This is from Stephen Goldstein. You can follow Stephen at AlphaMind101 over on Twitter. Stephen is a retired uh, trader. He's a world famous trading coach, uh, really having to do with trading psychology. Um, he has a great podcast that you can listen to, the AlphaMind101 podcast. 
And if you follow him there on Twitter, you can and he'll post on a new podcast. But he interviews all sorts of different traders, uh, from from uh, retail traders all the way up to hedge fund managers, large financial in institution uh, traders, and uh, picks their brains about their approaches. And uh, I was fortunate enough to be interviewed twice on his particular podcast. It's a great podcast, so check it out. And let's see what Stephen has to say today. You can make a lot of money through luck, but luck is not a strategy. One of the biggest challenges in trading is staying on your path and in your lane. When you hear of others doing much better, that is the ego challenge. The big risk from, you, uh, from this is you start taking bets outside of a process. You're searching for luck. It's your process that delivers over time. If you are serious about trading success, don't get sidelined out of your process because you heard of an 18 year old who made uh, X millions on crypto. They bought a lottery ticket, that ticket came in and full congratulations to them, but trading isn't about buying lottery tickets. So, you know, this is really important. This is, um, uh, this is the key sentence. It's your process that delivers over time. And when crypto's up or when the market's up and you hear about peace people making all these millions of dollars, well, like Steven says, they bought some type of lottery ticket and the lottery ticket came in. And full well, congratulations. But trading is not about buying a lottery ticket. Don't get don't let this happen to you. Don't let people tell you about this trade they made where they made all this kind of money. Because really that was luck. And over time, luck is not what's going to pay you in the market. It is about having your process. That's, you know, you hear me talk about this ad nauseum on this podcast. Process, 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 process. Your process is, is not always going to work. I don't always make money every day or every week or every month. I don't. I wish I did. But I do follow my process because I know over time my process is what pays me and that's how I make my living. So don't get swayed by advertise, advertisements or stories about people that did this and they made all sorts of money. Good for them, but really it was luck. And we don't want to rely on luck. We want to rely on having a process with good trading, technical fundamentals and strategies that over time gives you an edge. So one more time, you can make a lot of money through luck, but luck is not a strategy. One of the biggest challenges in trading is staying on your path and in your lane. When you hear of others doing much better, that's the ego challenge. The big risk uh, from this is you start taking bets outside of a process. You're searching for luck. You're like, man, I only made this much and those guys made this much. I'm going to start putting a big bet on this, that, or the other. That's luck. It's your process that delivers over time. If you are serious about trading success, don't get sidelined out of your process because you heard of an 18-year-old who made X millions on crypto. They bought a lottery ticket uh, that came in and full congratulations to them, but trading isn't about buying lottery tickets. It's such a good post, everyone. And please listen to Steven's podcast, Alpha Mind 101, so you can hear from traders all over the world and what their approaches are. And you, before we start taking a look at my potential trades next week, you know, I mentioned to you that I had a record uh, uh, trading day last Thursday. And ironically, that was the day that I was the sickest because I have this cold down here in Colombia. And I started thinking about it. I talked to a friend of mine, uh, one of my previous trading partners, Ava, and I mentioned to her uh, that I had a record day, but I was very, very sick. And she said, you know, when we used to trade, the days that you were sick, you always seem to trade the best. And I thought about it and I was like, you know, you're right. And that's, you know, something to consider. Why do I trade the best if I have a cold or I have a flu? Well, I thought about this a lot last night. And you know what it really is? I mean, I said to my girlfriend when I woke up this, I said, oh man, I don't know how I'm going to trade today. I just don't really have the, the strength to battle. That's the key word, the battle. Look, I make a lot of day trades every day, you know, in addition to my swing trades on um, the daily and weekly time frames. And I just didn't have the strength because of my flu to battle. Why did I have such a really good day? I wasn't battling. 
you know, with day trading, I battle. I get in their battle. I use all the, you know, the right trading processes and all this kind of stuff. But sometimes I battle. And the days that I was not sick, I just literally followed my process because I didn't have the strength to get in there and battle with the market. And I end up having a, re a record day. So keep that in mind. This is just another example of why it's best not to overthink and just follow your process. So I was very glad to have that day. It was amazing. When I got done the day, I was like, how did I make that much money? Just following the process because I didn't have the strength to get in there and actually deviate from the process. So anyway, I, I think that was something we're telling you and just keep that in mind. Follow your process, process, process. Don't rely on luck. Like Steven says, the big risk, uh, I'm sorry, it's your process that delivers over time. It's your process that delivers over time. So thank you very much, Steve. Um, appreciate that post. And please follow him at Alpha Mind 101 Thanks, Steve. All right. Let's take a look at potential trades for next week and see what we got. Now, again, these trades are not where they need to be. What I do on the weekends is I take a look at levels. I take a look at levels that would have confluences of different levels and indicators lining up. And I say, you know, that looks like a good place to buy. I don't know if it's going to get there or a good place to short. I don't know if it's going to get there, but if it does get there, I will certainly consider taking the trade. So I have eight symbols here that I'm looking for for next week. Keep in mind, these could potentially all uh, trigger on the same day. That doesn't mean I would take all eight trades. I would narrow the trade down to the best one of the eight. If they all trigger, I'm going to narrow it down to the best one. How am I going to do that? Well, many things. I'm going to look at which one has the most confluences or combinations of indicators lining up. Which one has the best risk to read? ratio? Which one looks best on multiple time frames? Which one has, uh, which one is strongest relative to the rest of the market? These, this is the treasure hunt portion of analyzing multiple time frames, multiple indicators. Are they lining up the relative strength of that particular market? Is the risk to reward ratio? Is this one better than that one? And I have to narrow it down. And again, this is what I teach in my one-on-one -on -one course is how to do this. And it's a very important. I really think it's what differentiates uh, profitable traders from losing traders is being patient, waiting for the confluences, looking at the multiple time frames. Okay, it's very, very important. So let's start and take a look at Anheuser-Busch. Well, you can see the highlighted blue areas here. And from a, a podcast that I did several weeks ago, I drew this box here and I said, this is the area that I would be interested in buying Budweiser. Budweiser at the time was about up here. I said, if it comes down to this area, this is where I would buy. Well, it never quite got to my level. My level was the 250, the 300 or the 200. It just barely missed it. Otherwise it would have bought here, but this was the general area. You can see that area was the correct. I mean, we had a big, big move up in Budweiser, B-U-D, but I didn't get it. That's how it goes. You can't get them all, but I had in the future here. Now I did draw the blue box again. This coincides with the 200 day moving average, the 300 day moving average, or the 250, the 300, and the 200. Again, this area in here is what I would be looking for. We're getting close to the negative third ATR channel. I wouldn't take a trade just based upon that, but I do know that about 92% of prices when they get into this third ATR channel stop going down and or move up. That's dovetailing with the support of the major moving average of the 250 and the 300 or the 200 day moving average. I can also tell that if we do get down here and test this low, we will have a double bottom with a bullish divergence in place. Maybe even a double bottom bullish divergence with a missing right shoulder, which is what I learned from studying one on one with Dr. Alexander Elder. And he believes that double bottom bullish divergence are some of the strongest technical signals in all of uh, technical analysis. And so there's multiple things going on here. We, we're near the negative third ATR channel. We're near the 250 day moving average. We're near the 300 day moving average. We're near the 200 day moving average. We also have a double bottom bullish divergence. Look at this low here. Look at the strong deep red MACD bars. That measures momentum. 
Now we're getting close to that low again. No red bars whatsoever. In order for this to be double bottom bullish divergence, we do need to come down and test this low, but I can just tell from experience that even if we do test this low, we're probably not even going to have any green, any red bars, or if we do have some red bars, they'll be very shallow compared to this move. What is that telling us? That's telling us that even though this move looks substantial, it means that we are running out of selling we're running out of selling momentum or we're running out of sellers. And if you run out of sellers, the implication is you're going to go up. So lots of confluences here on Budweiser, a ton of them. Negative third ATR channel, 200 day moving average, 300 day moving average, 200 day moving average, double bottom bullish divergence here. We'll have an RSI divergence as well. We'll have an ATR divergence as well. So to me in this area, but only if we get here, if we, if we intraday reject the 200 and the, the 300, um, then that's a p potential entry. If we move down stronger and reject the 200 day, absolutely. But we're coming, in, in my opinion, into some key levels here and confluences of levels here. But I need the, the market to show me that it res it's respecting these levels here or respecting these levels here before I get in. But I really like this potential trade if we reject the 250, 300, or the 200-day moving average, especially in light that we have a double bottom bullish divergence here, MACD divergence here. So Budweiser looks good to me, but I just need to watch the price action next week. Cameco, all right. So I almost bought this on Thursday. Why? Well, because on Thursday, CCJ is a symbol, by the way. We came down, we had a bounce at the 200-day moving average. This is a legitimate entry signal, especially in light that we have a double bottom bullish divergence with a missing rat MACD uh, divergence here. I didn't buy this on Thursday, even though it was legitimate, because the prior buy bar was such a big down bar. I hesitate to buy when you are buying with a big bar right behind you. Why? Well, a big bar that's larger than one ATR is indicating that there was distribution on this bar. It doesn't mean that after you have distribution, you can't go back up, but it makes it less likely. Do you see what I mean? So here on Wednesday, we had a big down bar, which concerned me. And then I did see this trade on Thursday and I said, should I take this? I mean, it's a decent risk to reward ratio. We do have the MACD divergence. And I said, no, I'm not going to take it just because of the big, big bar here. Well, I was wrong. Friday had a nice move up 2.9%. So I'm certainly not going to chase it here with this big bar and this big bar. What I'm going to wait for, again, this is patience. I'm going to wait for it to possibly come back retest that 200 day moving average and give me a better risk to reward ratio. It may not. I may have lost it. The train may have left the station. Who knows? Maybe it comes all the way back up. I, I kind of doubt it, but it is certainly possible. And if it does, good for the shareholders of CCJ. But for me, it's a game of being patient. If we were to come back, very likely we could come back and test this 200 day moving average. I would be potentially interested if we do that. I uh, in, uh, another option would be now that we've moved back up into the value zone, green bar here, or green line here, green line here, this is the value zone. A lot of times when you come from a lower low, you'll come back up into the value zone and then pull back and then get a higher low V1 or V2. That would be the other option. And again, if you want to learn more about V1s, V2s, just go to my YouTube channel, watch that video. So two potentials here next week. A higher low V1, V2 would be a great entry uh, signal or a, another move and test back of the 200-day moving average. McDonald's. Okay. McDonald's got walloped, obviously, in the last few days here. Um, the two levels that I'm looking at are the 200-day moving average here, the black line, and even further down, we have the 300-day moving average. Ideally, for me, the place to buy this would be if we come down to the orange line, which is the 300-day moving average. I know it looks very bearish, very big bars, looks scary. I realize that. But the 300-day moving average here is um, dovetailing with a 30 RSI. Right now, we're at a 32.29 RSI. We're getting into low RSIs. 
an under 30 over 30 is legitimate signal but as i always say it's best to have a confluence of signals if we were to come down next week reject that 300 day moving average and also have an intraday rejection of the 30 rsi one of the strongest signals in my experience is rejection of a major moving average and a rejection of the 30 rsi at the same time so that's why i drew the blue box right here but if we close back above the 200 i don't think i'm going to take that trade why just because of all the distribution that happened in this bar even if it closes above the 200 i don't think it's going to make it up very high i think the chances would be very low but if i buy it at the 300 day moving average and a rejection of the 300 then it gives me some potential upside before we kind of get back into this danger area so if it closes above the 200 not going to buy it i need this to come down further reject the 300 day moving average ideally reject the uh, 30 rsi and give me a good risk to reward ratio then i would consider it pfizer all right well you hear me talk about abandoned babies you hear me talk about island reversals being some of my new favorite trading approaches this is an island reversal abandoned baby consists of one bar island reversal consists of two bars see how we gap down we had a day sideways and we gapped up so we had a uh, very bearish sentiment immediately followed by bullish sentiment these usually mark tops and bottoms <clears throat> i didn't buy it up here i wanted to wait for it to come back fill that gap never did unfortunately and the island reversal paid off and it moved up nicely but what i'm waiting for right now is i am waiting for a move back into this blue box what's important about this blue box well this is a on this particular day here on the 11th was a structure change to the upside why well we had a low we ran the low we took out the first swing high strongly this changed on this particular day this changed pfe pfizer into a bullish market structure and again after you change into a bullet market structure there's a tendency to move back down before you have another significant move up fair value gaps after the structure change there's three bars bar one bar two bar three there is a gap between the low of bar one i'm sorry the low of bar three and the high of bar one bar one two three the high of bar one the low of bar three this is a gap that the market has not tested there was only buy side liquidity on this particular day if pfizer comes back into this gap between the high of bar one low of bar three this is my entry area with the blue and you know i don't know how it's going to look i don't know if i'm going to buy if it just comes down a little if it came down to the bottom i would certainly buy it but maybe i get a v1 or a v2 but this to me is a buy area most importantly though where's your stop well right here at the swing low that's why i've drawn this orange line here that would be my stop so as far as what it looks like next week i'm not exactly sure but if it comes down here ideally coming down rejecting the bottom of this fair value gap and closing back up would give me a lot of confidence to get into this trade but pfizer this does look like the a, a, a at least a medium term low has been put in vis-a-vis -vis the island reversal here but this particular day on the 11th we did change market structure just waiting for a pullback again when you change market structure to the upside you very often get a bit of a pullback before you get another move up it's just people taking profits and some price discovery but again on pfizer looking next week to buy somewhere between 2774 and 2733 in this fair value gap my end of day stop would be a close below the swing low here at 2675 all right philip morris all right philip morris i do not this is not a potential trade but what i'm doing here is i'm highlighting a potential trade on the next stock which is virgin galactic spce this is a perfect example of a higher low v1 or v2 in this case it's a v2 and again check out my video in on my youtube channel about v ones v2s one of my favorite favorite approaches uh green line here green line here anywhere in here is the value zone 
And again, this I teach this higher low V1s, V2s. I teach this in my one-on-one -on -one course. Such a great strategy. You can make a living just trading this. Honestly, I, I fully believe that. Um, the first requirement is that we close below the, the negative one ATR channel, or in other words, we close below the value zone. Then we move up into the value zone, which it did, and then we pull back, and then we create a V1 or a V2. This is a V2, bar one, bar two. Bar two goes below the, bar, the low of bar one's low, closes above the close of bar one's close. This creates a V2, and this low is higher than this low. That's why it's called a higher low V2 in the value zone. So this would have been your entry point. Your stop would simply be a close below halfway of the washout bar, the V2 bar here. And look how that just took on off. We had a low, we came in, there was some profit target, pulled it back. Then we created the higher low V2 while MACD was green, by the way, this adds to the possibility of this being a profitable trade. And look at that, no sweat, just easy trade, higher low trades, whether they're off 200s, 30 RSIs, 250s, 300s, or higher low V1s or V2s in the value zone are great trades because they tend to work right away like this, higher lows, higher lows, higher lows. If you're shorting, lower highs, lower highs, lower highs. So the reason I'm showing you this is that there's no there's no trade here on Philip Morris, but again, just how powerful higher low V1s, V2s can be. And you can see entry point would have been 89, 96, or 94, it would have been a great, great trade. But again, the reason I'm showing you this is SPCE. Does it look a little familiar? Look, we have a low, we wrap, this is Philip Morris, we have a low, rally into the value zone, we pull back, okay, Virgin Galactic. We have a low, we rally into the value zone, we've pulled back. Does that mean we buy yet? No. I need a higher low V1 or V2 first, which means on Monday, if we go down and reverse back up, it gives me a V1. Or over the next couple days, if I get a V2, it's a higher low V2 while MACD is green. Very, very similar to Philip Morris. Just look at this part here. Close below, in, pull back, V2, great. So if we look at it without the move, look at this. Close below, in, kind of pull back. Look at that. And then look at Virgin Galactic right now. It's very, very similar. Low, pull back. Uh, move into the value zone, pull back. I just need a V1, V2, just like on Philip Morris here. Here was the V1, V2. This is V2. So what I'm looking for next week on, on SPCE is a v, higher low V1 or V2. Doesn't mean it's going to work out like Philip Morris, but improves your chances. So I'll definitely be looking for a higher low V1, V2 on SPCE. Bonds. Okay. So I did take I did take that trade on bonds on Tuesday. Didn't work out for me. Small loss. Rejected the 200. Close below. I'm out. But bonds are back to an interesting point here. Here we have an order block to the downside. We have the lowest low. We have the high and the low before a market structure change took place. The market structure took place here when we took out this um, swing high. Look at the fair value gap. From here to here, we have a low, we make a lower low, we run, we change market structure to the upside. Again, a lot of pullbacks after market structures. Here's bar one, here's bar two, here's bar three, low of bar three, high bar one. Right here's your fair value gap. This is where it, sh this is where it should bounce. And did it bounce? Right away. Pretty amazing. But now we're back to the top of this order block, the high and the low there should be support from this high to this low. So in this area here, next week would be a buy area. And if you, interestingly enough, if you look at TLT on Thursday, look, it touched the high of that order block and bounced. Next, yesterday, went below, but then closed above the high of that order block those levels are important. It doesn't mean that this can't go down, but you can see for two days, it respected the high of that order block to the penny. 
to the penny on Thursday, went a little bit below it on Friday, but still closed back above. So coming, so bonds coming down into this it, it, from 92.86 to 91.94, this is TLT, by the way, uh, would be a, the best place would be at the bottom because we're at the negative third ATR channel in your stop, which is simply be a close below this. But with TLT coming down, the bond, the TLT price coming down, of course, interest rates go up. And that is what we have seen in the market is that interest rates are increasing. And that is most likely the reason you've seen the sell off in the market. But with TLT bouncing at this particular level at the high of the order block, this may be bullish for the market next week because the market right now is following is basically a slave to what interest rates are doing. So TLT coming in, holding this level here, that may be the end of the move down and a potential move up. If it's a potential move up, interest rates will go down and most likely the market will go back up. I don't know. I wish I had a crystal ball. All I can do is look at the technicals here. But for me, I want to get long again TLT. I'm hoping that it comes down a little deeper to give me a little better risk to reward ratio, but we'll see. But big picture with the market, this is positive as far as interest rates go. And I'm definitely looking to buy TLT here. I'm just not sure I have to, I'll see it when I know it next week and it may just take off and I, I missed it. But anywhere deeper in the vat, anywhere deeper in the gap here, uh, even without a V1 or V2, I'd most likely buy TLT. <coughs> okay, Tesla, excuse my voice, everyone. Tesla, boy, not doing so hot to Molly. Um, you know, I drew this red line here Thursday night. This is the 30 RSI level. We're under the 30 RSI right now. We're at 2903. So that 30 RSI level right now above us is uh, um, resistance above. And you can see during the day, we tried to get above it and then close below it. We're at the negative third ATR channel, so I'm not surprised we're, we're getting some sideways motion here. But what I am really looking for on Tesla here is, you see, I drew the trend line from this low to this corresponding low and out into time. You can see it draws it out down here to about 160 to 150. Right now we're at 163. If the price did move all the way down and touch this trend line, it most likely would have a reaction. I don't know for sure, but in my experience, I've seen this a lot. There is a double bottom bullish divergence here. We have deep red. Here we're lower, obviously. We do not have as deep red. So uh, if we got to the trend line, uh, that would almost be an automatic buy for me. Uh, uh, the other uh, potential is next week if we close above the 30 RSI and have it under 30 over 30. So that's what I'm thinking about on Tesla. I also have a potential trade on the weekly on Tesla as well. But, you know, Tesla has sold off significantly. It's certainly out of favor. But two things I'm looking for is if we move into the trend line out in the future here, I've kind of drawn this, uh, this blue box right around here. Uh, but if we come down and touch that trend line, almost certainly I would buy it. The other option is if we close above the negative third ATR channel and the uh, uh, 30 RSI as well. So those are the uh, daily uh, trades that I'm looking at. And now let's take a look at some weeklies. And again, everyone, just um, want to remind you, if you are interested in working with me, doing my 15-hour one-on-one course, just send me an email. It's such a great course. You're going to learn so much. You're going to be a much better trader. I promise you. I love to teach. It always helps me to teach, and, and uh, I think I teach some really good things to my students. It's a great, great course. Okay, Apple. All right, I've talked a lot about order blocks today, and Apple has sold off significantly. It recovered a little bit on uh, this particular week. It was up 1.1%, but this is an order block. Hit this lowest bar before market structure changed, somewhere between 173.60 and 165.30. That's a lot of range. I realize that. But here in this blue box where we're at, this seems to me technically like a buy area. The lower this goes, 
the better, obviously, because the bottom of the order block here is 165.30. Ideally, and I would buy this for sure, is if Apple came down, tested 165.30, and then closed back above, that would be a, that would show me that it rejected the bottom of that order block, and it would, of course, give me the best risk to reward ratio as well. I don't know if that's going to happen, but you can see now that we've got into the order block from 173.60 down to 165.30, you can see that is where Apple finally did catch a little bit of a bounce. So I'll just have to wait next week if we were to get a V1 inside this uh, blue uh, shaded area, I would certainly consider buying that. Um, so I, I would, I think the best way for me to say this is if we get a V1 next week, I definitely would take it, especially considering we're in the in, in the order block area. Uh, or if we come down and reject the bottom of the order block, I certainly would get long there as well. Adobe. Oof. Well, this is a good reason, a good example of why I never hold through earnings. Sometimes you hold through earnings and you make a lot of money. It could go zooming up. But there are times where it does not go your way. And Adobe was down 10.74% on the week. Just a horrible, horrible week. So what I am looking for on Adobe you would probably think the 200 day moving average and the negative third is what I'm looking for. It's n no, because this bar is so, so big. What I would really be looking for is a buy down here. And I don't know if it's going to get there. I have to be very, very patient, but if I'm very patient and it does eventually get there, I, this would make sense to me because here's the 250 day moving average. If we did get down to that area, Again, you'd probably be in the low 30s. You could potentially get a rejection of the 250 and a rejection of the 30 RSI level. That would make a lot of sense on a, on a stock like Adobe, ADBE, where I would be interested. But even next week, if it rejects this 200 week moving average, I'm not gonna take it. And why? Because of this big down bar. There was obviously a lot of distribution in this bar. I think it's gonna have a difficult time getting back up through all this sell-off. But down here is a different story because I have a better risk to reward ratio, I have a lower price, and I have some movement maybe from here up to here, which is about uh, the extent of where I think it's gonna go. So for Adobe next week, if and only if it gets down, rejects this 30 RSI or rejects the 250 week moving average, that's where I'd be interested. Pfizer, I talked about Pfizer again on the daily. Um, but what I'm looking for on the weekly on Pfizer would be a higher low V1 or V2. Um, <laughs> this actually happened last week. I missed the trade. I don't know why, but you see the V1 bar one, bar two, bar two goes below, bar one's low, closes above. This is higher than this low. That's a higher low V1 in the value zone that worked out great, 2.65%. I'm not going to chase it up here. I have the, the blue highlighted blue on the daily, remember in the fair value gap here. I, I would definitely consider getting long here on the daily, but on the weekly, I would like this to pull back. We were below the value zone. Now we're in the value zone. I would like this to pull back a little bit and then a higher low V1 or V2 while MACD is green. Pfizer to me looks like the, the, the short-term lows are in. Now I'm just looking for a dip to buy. So specifically, we're below the value zone, we're in the value zone. I just needed to pull back and give me a higher low V1 or V2 in the coming weeks. Last but not least, Tesla. Okay, I talked about Tesla on the daily um, with potentially going down, hitting that extended trend line or a close above the 30 RSI. I like the weekly trade better because of the confluence of signals here. You can see this line here is the 300 week moving average. This 300 week moving average is kind of very close to the extension of the trend line. And if we do get to this 300 day moving average, we'll also be in the low 30 RSIs. We have that confluence, 30 RSI, major moving average like the 300 week moving uh, average and cherry on top, we have the extension of the trend line down here. So this area somewhere between 
160.39 to 154.17 would definitely be a good area. And again, on these weeklies, there's four of them. Technically, all four of them could trigger next week. I'm not going to buy all four. I'm only going to buy one. I'm going to narrow it down to the best trade. What has the multiple? What has the most confluences and, uh, uh, and combinations of indicators lining up? Which one looks best on the higher time frame? Which one has the best relative strength? Which one's giving me the best risk to reward ratio? Um, Makes sense. So let's take a look at the markets in general to finish up the day. And um, let's take a look here. Oh, by the way, I forgot to mention. Uh, I talked about. Uh, I talked about my one on my private one on one course. Great course. Uh, it costs seventeen hundred fifty bucks. I know that's tough for some people, but I have. If, if that's not you know financially, if that's not av uh, available for you, um, or you know that would put you in a in difficult position. I have a, a a good alternative. If you go to the link in my description uh, there for uh, Udemy.com, I have a video course on Udemy.com. It's very inexpensive. Sorry about that. I had somebody just knock at the door there. But I was just talking about the uh, online course at Udemy.com. I teach you the deep dip buy uh, stock trading approach. Um, it's nine and a half hours of video. I teach you step by step. It's very, very affordable. That code for that course is in the description. So let's take a look at the markets in general. Let's look at the cues to begin with. You know, it's interesting. Here's the value zone, the top green. If you remember from pod from uh, podcast in uh, last week, I talked about if you get a, law, a bar larger than one ATR that comes down into the value zone. In my experience, there's about a seventy percent chance if this happens that you're going to go down and you're going to touch the bottom of the value zone. That's exactly what happened. Look, big bar larger than one ATR came into the value zone. Again, 70% of the time, if that happens, you're probably going to go to the bottom of the value zone. Look at that. Isn't that amazing? So we have this big reversal bar here. We came back up to about halfway of this, and then we came back down here. So what does that mean as far as the market goes? Well, I, I talked to you about bonds where bonds did find some support from some of the top of that order block. That gives me a little bit of hope that we may get a rally market based upon that. But right now, if I was looking to trade Qs, what I would need to see is some sideways motion in the future and then a, and then a V1 or a V2. Right now, this is not enough for me to just get on the Qs, but it's interesting as if you've listened to the podcast for a while, I was calling for a top for multiple reasons, but look at the high here, green back Another high with less green MACD bars, and then we made another high with no green MACD bars, just simply running out of buyers. Again, this is called the double top, but in this case, triple top with a bearish MACD divergence. It's worked out the conditions in favor of the bar down. So, right now, we certainly could go lower, but for me to get long in the market in general, like the Qs, I would just want to see it move sideways. As always, be very careful, everyone. Um, we talked about what we're going to talk about. We want to move from very low and change market structure, trade on the side. So we certainly could have some more moves back down if that continue comes back down the markets and moves back down the market. I appreciate you being here, everyone. I hope this was helpful. If it was helpful, I'm uh, going to take the time to hit the thumbs up button. I'm going to like the channel now. Let's do some more survival content. I appreciate you spending your time. Please try to buy something nice or something else.
U.S. government Options, futures, and forex trading is not appropriate for everyone. While there is a potential for large rewards, there is also a substantial risk of loss associated with trading. The material in this video or live broadcast is not geared towards any particular individual or to any particular financial situation and is not intended to meet the particular investment objectives of any viewer. This video or live broadcast, like all instructional materials produced by Gossip Trading and Mentoring LLC, is created and published for informational and educational purposes only. Any and all information contained in, implied, or referenced by this video or live broadcast is not to be construed as investment advice, and no representation is made that any individual or entity involved in production of this video or live broadcast is an investment or financial advisor or is registered or authorized to give any financial advice. We are publishers and educators only. Therefore, the various producers of this video or live broadcast will not accept liability for any loss or damage of any kind, which may arise either directly or indirectly out of the use of any of this material, including any loss of profit no representation is made that any account or investment will or is likely to achieve the profit or losses demonstrated. We recommend consultation with a licensed and qualified professional before making any investment decision. This video or live broadcast is not to be construed as an offer to buy or sell any security, financial instrument, or financial product of any kind. Notice is hereby given that any individual or entity involved in production of this video or live broadcast or their clients may have an interest in any security, financial instrument, or financial product mentioned or referenced. Any simulated or hypothetical performance result depicted does not represent actual trading and therefore may under or overcompensate for the impact of various market factors, such as lack of liquidity. Thank you.